Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Shelby on Safari live stream in which I, Shelby, a wild animal biologist, often likes to bring in the worlds of pop culture and history to expand our knowledge and our love and passion for the wonderful wild world that surrounds us all. Tonight is no exception. We are going to be hitting the road and traveling across across the globe from the comfort of your home mobile device, wherever you are watching this live stream. And whether it be in replay or joining me, I encourage you to comment below where you're at, how you're doing, and your favorite cat. Because tonight, it's everybody wants to be a cat. We are discussing weird cats. And no, I'm not referring to my own cat, Maui, although he certainly uh, fits the bill in terms of weird cats. But we're going to meet some wild cats. And I know when it comes to cats, people often think, well, they're lazy. They just sleep all day. There's some common misconceptions about these incredible felines. And tonight, we are going to meet one that is associated with the forest, with the desert, and believe it or not, with water. That's right. So join me, subscribe, join the safari, all of that wonderful jazz. If you haven't already, it is a most excellent time to uh, be joining the Safari Squad. In fact, I'll put a little ticker there just so you can remember to join. And yeah, usually I do animal pop culture video comparisons, like what animal is like a real life Pokemon. But I thought uh, I'd take a pause from that for tonight because I wanted to talk all things kitty cats. Because lately on my mind, I've been thinking of cats. And there are some cats that don't get enough attention. And I know typically when I talk cats, it's all about cheetahs. And fair enough, because cheetahs are the best. But I think uh, it's time to shed some light on some smaller cats, quite literally. And apologies if you're watching this and I'm going to be quite glitchy. It's very windy and stormy out tonight. And that often has serious implications on my Wi-Fi. So I do apologize. And I really hope I don't pause at a most awkward time when I'm making a really awkward face, which typically tends to happen. So as if you have uh, joined me on a Safari Squad live stream before, I encourage you to comment when uh, I have my pop quiz questions because it's very interactive. I love seeing who joins and I'm always up for meeting some new friends. But without further ado, let us get started with where you can find me. Here's all the different places from Instagram to Clubhouse to Facebook to Twitter, which I don't really use, but I put it on there. <laughs> so much variety in terms of where you can find me. I encourage you, if you haven't already, check me out on Instagram. That's where I do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and you get really kind of some spoilers as to upcoming videos, whether they be for this week or in the future. So I encourage you, if you're into that thing, uh, follow me there because it's fun and I'm going someplace cool tomorrow. So yeah, join me over there. Anyways, anyways, we could talk social media for ages. Hi, Lucky L. Oh, it, wait, is tonight snooker night? Uh-oh, it might be snooker. Oh, wait, no, because you said it's like on the first and third of the month, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, welcome. Uh, we're talking cats tonight. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to three weird cats. So first, I thought we'd start off with the fishing cat associated with water, given its name. Uh, this beautiful cat, I mean, take a look at those markings. Gee whiz, absolutely stunning. And this wonderful cat is actually vulnerable on the IUCN Red List. Now, I feel like if you're not familiar with the IUCN Red List, don't worry. It is one of the most common ways to identify an animal's level of risk at being extinct. And many of you might be familiar, you know, with endangered, near threatened, vulnerable. Those are all some of the key terms that the IUCN, the International Congress for the Union of Nature, uh, has to identify where animals sit. And so vulnerable isn't too bad, but obviously it's not ideal. Like we'd rather them not be on the list at all. Um, but last, there they are. They're vulnerable on the list and they're native to Southern Asia. Uh, across a few different countries within uh, Southern Asia. But the primary thing to know about the fishing cats is that they're very elusive and nocturnal in nature. And actually that kind of holds true for these three cats I'm gonna introduce you to is that there's still a lot to be discovered. And I think that's what I really love about science and the world and 
life in general is that there's always so much more to learn and explore. Like we're never going to know everything, right? Um, and if we do, oh God, that's going to be so boring. <laughs> but there's so much to discover about these particular species. And part of the thing when I say vulnerable on the IUCN red list, that's with the information they have. And there are a lot of question marks with these species. And so it may be better or it may be worse than what you might think. Fingers crossed, as an eternal optimist, it's better than what we think. But hey-ho, there we go. Ah, ah, yes, so snooker is on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. Excellent. Ah, so I timed it well tonight, talking weird cats. Um, by the way, Lucky Al, if you want to let me know what your favorite cat is, a uh, cat species, let me know. I'm curious. Is it a cheetah? It better be a cheetah. Uh, but you better not be a cheetah at snooker. Oh! Yeah. Could you even cheat at snooker is that even a thing because like everybody's watching you and it's like you'd have to be like oh look there's superman and like blink a ball in with your hand or something i'm sure you could cheat at snooker anyways so <laughs> the fishing cat um in terms of its size just to put it in perspective it's actually one of the largest of the 28 species of small cats so there's a variety of different small cats uh the cheetah actually speaking of the cheetah it is technically a big cat, but it's a weird big cat. So it's not really a big cat, but it's not really a small cat either. Uh, but the fishing cat is one of the largest of the 28 different species of small cats in terms of classification. Given their name, it shouldn't be as a surprise that they are associated with water. And in fact, they're found throughout Southern Asia in kind of wetland areas like marshes, mangrove forests, swamps, things like that, because they are, and they rather enjoy being by water per se. Now, they are without a doubt fantastic swimmers. And let's see if the little video will work. Will it work? Oh, we get to see them. Aren't they so cute? Oh, this one, it's a little bit dark in this video, but look at that face. Oh, so sweet. Such a sweet cat. And looks quite wet. Maybe it just got out of swim. Uh, but yeah, they actually enjoy swimming. And they have partial webbing in between their toes and their claws actually protrude slightly even when they're retract. So they're not fully kind of retractable. The claws are still a little bit sticking out. And this is really important because it actually helps them capture prey, especially when they're underwater. Um, and it just adds that little extra support to grab on to their prey. Now, in terms of this question, y'all know I love a pop, pop quiz question. So their fur, given that they are, you know, in the water, has to be quite specialized. And this is a really interesting adaptation that they have to keep them warm when they're underwater. So one layer, there's two different layers of the fishing cat's fur. One layer is short and super dense. And this is to keep their skin warm. It's really compact. It's kind of like a... Uh, a layer, a uh, wetsuit layer, I would imagine <laughs> as a surfer, my first thought goes to a wetsuit, uh, but it's, it, it's really compact and dense. So that way their skin doesn't actually get wet. It, it's it, the fur kind of holds it there. Now the longer layer of fur, so that layer was quite short and dense. The longer layer of fur is called what? Now this layer of fur provides their camouflage pattern. Um, and yeah, it, it the their different markings which help them blend in. What do you think out of the question out of the options is this layer, the longer layer of fur on the fishing cat called? Is it called A guard hairs, B long hairs, or C pattern hairs since it gives their coat its pattern? What do you think? Hey, hello Tiffany. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, nice to see you. Oh, haha, ha, I never cheat at snooker and no cheating at snooker is possible yet. Okay, okay, so it is possible, but not ideal. I'm glad you don't cheat at snooker, lucky LD. Uh, <laughs> pattern hairs, okay, Tiff coming in hot with pattern hairs. Cat species is the tiger. I'll let that slide. I'll let it slide this one's lucky LD. Okay, so we have C, both of you guys are saying C for pattern hairs. I feel bad because I kind of curveball quite literally with this one, they're actually called guard hairs. And, you know, it's ironic because given that the shorter hair that's closer to their body technically guards their hair from you know, water and things like that getting in, whereas, yeah, the longer hairs are for their pattern, but they're called guard hairs. Who knew? 
Well, now you do. Uh, but yes, so that is the fishing cat's fur. One of their adaptations, apart from, you know, their webbing, partial webbing between their toes uh, to help them swim, just like this one's doing. So cool to see one swimming. And here's another great shot of them by the water. Now, which actually leads me to discuss, even though their name suggests that they eat just fish because they're fishing cats, uh, these particular species of felines are more generalist per se, and they'll eat whatever's available. They're quite opportunistic, which is one of the reasons why I don't think Maui would do very well in the real world. Um, even though we did rescue him from the docks of Southampton, <laughs> I don't think he would have done well. He's very, very, very picky. Whereas the fishing cats aren't so picky. Uh, they'll eat anything from kind of rodents to shellfish to lizards, to even chickens. They can go after livestock. In particular, they go after chickens. And ironically, I found a source that said, uh, I mean, I'd love to see this in person. I mean, love is kind of a weird word, but... They've been known to swim underwater to grab a duck's legs and pull them and then kind of capture them underwater. Like, how crazy is that? Just imagining a cat that's not only A, comfortable in the water, but B, comfortable and confident enough to be underwater to then grab duck's legs. Did you want to come in? I know I mentioned your name. Now he's at the door. Um, you can come in if you want, but... I just thought that was crazy. Yeah, cats are so cool, Tiff. Yeah, good shout, good shout. And Tiff, I know, because you're in Greece, I, I've seen a few pictures on your Instagram of cats that you've come across as well. Um, do you think any of like the uh, stray cats in Athens would be up for swimming like the fishing cat? <laughs> I know you saw one that was close to Peter. That one was super cute. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's just absolutely crazy. And speaking of crazy, when it comes to sneaking up on a cat, and, you know, I think of specifically this fishing cat, and I think I have a picture here, yeah, where their ears have kind of flipped back. You can't quite sneak up on a cat. I mean, you can if someone's in deep sleep. And actually, funny story about Kiana yesterday. I was working from home, and Kiana was on the sofa behind me. And she was sleeping, but then she started growling in her sleep because I was like, oh, what is Maui picking on her? Because her and Maui don't get on. And I was like, oh, my God, who's messing with my baby girl? And she was just growling in her sleep at something, probably Maui, <laughs> dreaming about her naughty brother. But, uh, but yeah, I just thought that was absolutely fascinating. Anyways, uh, I want to know how many muscles do you guys think are in a cat's ear? Um, where was I going? Why would I did why did I mention Kiana sleeping? Oh, because she was sleeping and like when she's in a deep sleep, maybe you could sneak up on them. But when they're awake, you can't really sneak up on them. Oh, I'm glad that you've never heard of that. Just wait, just wait till you hear the other two. Lucky LD. But yeah, how many muscles do you guys think are in a cat's ear? Do you think it's A14, B6, C32, or D just one muscle in their ear? What do you think? Now, maybe it will help if I say that they can almost rotate their ear a full 180 degrees. Like that's a massive amount of flexibility within an ear. And you can kind of see it in the picture if you look really closely with your magnifying glass. Um, but this is so that they can hear in several directions without turning their head, which comes in handy when they're, you know, stalking prey. They're keeping their eyes on the prize, if you will, but listening for potential predators or other things that may influence their stalking ability. It really helps with things like that. So yeah, I'd be curious to see what you guys think in terms of how many ear, how many ears, how many ears do cats have? How many muscles do cats have in one ear? Ah, Tiff says 32. Well done, Tiff. Indeed, that is right. 32 whopping muscles in their ears alone. I just think that's absolutely incredible of an adaptation to have to life. <laughs> yes, Jason, the original 360 degree microphone. I really think maybe, maybe, you know, Rode microphone and those people, maybe they could create like a line of microphones that are named after cats in that regard. I know you got some connections, Jason, maybe, maybe throw that out there. Uh, <laughs> for all, for all the tech gurus out there, 
Jason is your go-to guy in terms of helping out, uh, know what the best best microphone is. I mean, is there any microphone, Jason, that you would suggest that's a 360 kind of degree microphone that could maybe be in competition with cats like the fishing cat? Let me know. All right. So time for a recent study. Y'all know I love chucking in recent studies. Uh, I'm a big fan of scientific publications. I'm actually an author myself. Hold on. Let me say that like uh, Green Goblin, William Defoe. Well, you see, I'm sort of a scientist myself. Yeah, that didn't quite work uh, to the advantage I wanted. But uh, anyways, in a recent study in 2020, Photographic evidence was presented of fishing cats in Western Nepal for the first time. So people had reported, hey, I think I've seen a fishing cat. And scientists were able to go out into the field, put a few different camera traps out there and actually get photographic evidence of a significant amount over time uh, as to actually see if that is indeed a fishing cat, but also kind of make sure and monitor kind of their habitat as well. And without a doubt, without a surprise, they were indeed found alongside shallow lakes and rivers. As we know, that's quite Im implemental to kind of what they do and how they hunt, even though they just don't eat fish. But uh, with that in mind, I wanted to throw in that they saw within the range that they noticed these fishing cats in Nepal, it was up to elevation of 220 meters above sea level. And I don't know about you, but whenever I think of Nepal, I think of the mountains, you know, the Himalayas. And I forget that there's areas of Nepal that are, you know, not that high above sea level. And that is friends where you can find kind of the fishing cat and uh, yeah, quite limited, restricted range of where you can find them, which, you know, can lead to possibly some of the reasons why they are classified as vulnerable on the IUCN red list, but really amazing nonetheless, especially in terms of just how capable they are in the water and the fact that they don't mind it. And speaking of water, I know Lucky LD, you mentioned you love tigers. Again, another great species of cat that actually can swim and somewhat enjoys swimming, to, for lack of a better phrase, whereas most cats aren't quite capable of swimming. Although saying that, bringing in the cheetah, there's a really crazy picture of a coalition of male cheetahs, because that's what they're called if they're group males, a coalition of male cheetahs trying to swim across a river. And it's a very intense photo. It often comes up on my Instagram feed. But yeah, I mean, they can swim, but they're not going to like it. They don't choose to particularly go in the water. But this cat certainly does, especially to help with hunting when it needs to really cool cat, the fishing cat. So I encourage you to uh, check them out. If you are interested, I'll pop some links down to more different sources in the link below so you can check it out later and maybe learn a bit more about the fishing cat. Because my idea with this is, uh, as my friend says, it, not to be quite, you know, a lecture and go into terribly in-depth detail uh, on overviews such as this, but more of a tidbit a sampling course, a tapas, if you will, of some amazing weird cat. So we recently just met the fishing cat of Southern Asia, a beautiful cat that is incredibly adapted to life in the water and making the most of it. But now, like I said, we're going to cover all the elements. I feel like Avatar, the last airbender here, cover, uh, covering everything except fire. Although no, fire could be associated with the desert. So we've talked about water, but now we are going down into the jungle to meet the one, the only beautiful Margay. So these beautiful cats are from Central to South America. So about um, Mexico down to Northern Argentina and Uruguay. Now they used to be found, and I'm so glad Tiff has joined us this evening. They used to be found in Texas, Tiffany. Uh, and the last one was spotted in the 1850s. And since then, well, it's believed to be that they are no longer found in Texas, now just from central Mexico down through Central uh, America into South America. Now, these guys are near threatened on the IUC and Red List. And as I mentioned, they are highly associated with the forest. And what makes them weird is... <laughs> they're incredibly adapted for life in the trees, quite literally. So sometimes these cats have been seen to kind of raise their families in the trees, hang out in the trees. And I don't know, like, please correct me if I'm wrong, but 
the experience I have of cats and trees is not the best. I can think of a few times when Maui and Tammy in particular got stuck in a tree at our old house and my husband actually had to climb up this tree and it wasn't a tree for climbing, right? Like it didn't have any nice supportive branches. It it was a poor tree, poor choice of tree by little baby Tammy and baby Maui to climb up. And it was really intense to try to get them down. And I don't know, like cats, obviously they do use trees, you know, keep their claws sharp and some trees are better for climbing, but just this, this cat, the Margay, how it utilizes its adaptations for life in the trees is fantastic. Particularly, I want to draw attention to their ankles. They have flexible ankles. And again, kind of like how the ears of the cat, like Jason said, are quite, you know, impressive that give microphones a run for their money. The ex ankle bones of the Margay can rotate 180 degrees downward. So this means that the Margay can actually go head first down a tree, which comes in handy when, you know, stalking, looking for prey or looking for predators that might get them. It really is helpful. In fact, they're the only cat in North America that can do that. So they're a very unique, special cat. And let's look at the video again, because I don't know, it's just crazy to think of how they can hold on that way. And there's another adaptation. In fact, their feet, they have really broad, soft feet for climbing. But one thing that they can do, <laughs> this is going to sound nuts, and I wish I had a picture, but they can also hang from their limbs, um, from like their hind foot off the off tree branches. Like, isn't that crazy? So they can be hanging off because of their flexible ankles and how good of a grip their foot have. They can be dangling <laughs> from one foot like a spider cat. Literally like spider cat. I wish Peter was a Margay cat. Actually, I don't because that's the pet trade and that's wrong. And so don't don't get Margays as pets. But I wish Peter, I bet Peter has some Margay in him just because how much he's like a spider cat. Um, they also have their beautiful tails to help with balance. Hey, Alice, we're talking kitty cats. Um, we met the fishing cat. And now we're talking about the Margay cat of Central and South America, who's very exceptionally good at climbing, much like my uh, amigos, uh, the Remy and Rory bunch uh, <laughs> that you have, Alice. I feel like they, they are very good climbers like the Margays. But like many cat species, you know, I know I keep referring to the cheetah, but surprise, they're my favorite. Uh, their tails help with their balances. As you can imagine, you know, climbing trees both up and down, jumping from tree to tree, tree, you got to have good balance and their tails certainly help with that. Now, a quick fire, true, true or false question. A young margay is called a kitten. Is that true? Is that false? Let me know. Oh, hello, Rita. Oh, and UK amphibians, everybody's here. Fantastic. So nice to see you all. And yes, if you're watching, please let me know that you're watching. It's so nice to meet new friends and see some familiar faces and uh, yeah, discuss all things weird cats. So in the comments, let me know. Do you think it's true that baby Margays are called kittens or is it false? And look at the little kittens. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I purposely put some of these photos that don't have really any relevance to kittens in this. Uh, PowerPoint, just so I could show you pictures of cute baby cats. <laughs> I mean, come on, like they're so sweet looking. And their markings actually remind me of a weird mix of a cheetah and a jaguar. I mean, look at their tear lines. They have very similar tear lines to the incredible cheetah as well. Um, but again, their coat helps with the camouflage like we saw with the fishing cat. And I know that seems a bit bizarre and a bit counterintuitive that the spots actually help them blend in. I don't know how it works, but it does. If you see some pictures of these cats in their native environment and it, depending on the shot, like it's so tricky to spot them. And uh, yeah, so we got a lot of trues. We got Alice saying true, Lucky Alice saying true. Oh, I'm glad I didn't catch you guys off guard. Indeed, it is true. They are called kittens. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to put a baby uh, baby Margay picture in here because they're so sweet. Now, Margays actually mate year round. Some cat species, you know, time it accordingly based on kind of food availability and whatnot. 
uh, and very kind of weather dependent of where they're at in the world. But the margay have the luxury of being able to mate year round. And females give birth to one or two young. And it looks like they're on the ground in this picture, but they are quite confident, you know, in the trees as well sometimes. So that's quite fascinating. Now, in terms of just their sheer athletic ability, you know, that with the Olympics recently, you know, in everybody's mind, the captive mar captive margays have been known to jump almost six meters straight into the air. That is whoppingly mahusive, but as if that wasn't impressive enough to jump six meters straight up in the air, they can also be known to jump nine meters horizontally. And for a relatively, you know, for a small cat, I think that is just a sheer insane kind of amount of athletic ability for them to be able to do this. And um, you know, like their ankles being able to rotate and this jumping capability, you know, from tree to tree or even on the ground. It's just impressive to say the least. And I know we talk often about cheetahs and leopards and tigers and all these beautiful big cats that are so charismatic. But sometimes I feel the smaller cats get left out. And like the fishing cat, there's still so much more to be discovered about the margay. And they actually have some competition, actually, which leads me to my next true or false uh, question about the margay. Please in the chat, let me know, true or false, do you think a margay may also be called a little ocelot? What do you guys think? What do you think? Yes, I'm glad you said you love kitties, Alice, because believe it or not, this one was for you. We were discussing, I was like, hmm, hmm. Let's talk cats. And then I thought, oh, let's talk weird cats. So yes, this live stream <laughs> actually was for you, Al. Oh, especially because I haven't been getting enough kitten pictures lately. Mm -hmm. Anyways, true or false? What do you guys think? A Marge may also be called a little ocelot. While I let you guys think, I'm going to do a shameless plug of my Safari Squad mug, which you can get down in the description below. Uh, notice that Maui crossed out this one bit to say Maui on Safari because that's what Maui does. Actually, actually, I'm going to tell on Maui. Yesterday, as I said, I was working from home. You know, Kiana was growling in her sleep behind me. Maui was sleeping actually up here in the studio for most of the day until the last half of the day when I was on a Teams call. And the computer was pretty much just like this. And I was sitting down. Maui goes outside, gets his paws dirty, comes inside, jumps on my notebook with my notes, you know, that I've been writing in all day, pounces on that. But then, but then he jumps into my lap, looks into the camera. And of course, people on the team's call are like, oh, he's so cute. Oh, he's so cute. But what does he do if his face is towards the camera, his butt's in my face, and he farts, farts in my face. And luckily, luckily, it was muted. So like, you couldn't hear it, like, because I think people on the other team's call would be like, uh-huh, sure, that was your cat. But no, it was. And it smelled so bad. <laughs> and yet Maui was just standing, you know, hamming it up to the camera, being like, yeah, I'm here. And then he just leaves. And so like, I was left with the stinky smell and foot prints all over my notebook. I know, I know, I was absolutely appalled by the behavior of my cat yesterday. But yet, nope, everybody on the team's call was like, oh, he's so cute. I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, you're not here smelling what I'm smelling, mate. Ah, oh, well, with that in mind, now that I've shamed my cat over the internet, uh, <laughs> true or false, a margay may also be called a little ocelot. Now I see some trues. Ooh. Oh, you just saw this video with the Coyote Pearson with one. Oh, did Coyote go to uh, show off some margays? That's exciting. Any any engagement to raise awareness of these lesser uh, loved and well-known species, I'm all for. Might have to check that out. Oh, we also got a false. Interesting, interesting, and a false. Well, friends, it's actually true. They are known as the little ocelot. Now, this is where I find it absolutely 
fascinating <laughs> because whoever did this, I think had a really sick sense of humor because this is really terribly ironic, right? So the Margay actively avoids the ocelot because not only is the ocelot a threat because of predation, the ocelot has been known to hunt, but more importantly, prey competition. So both the ocelot and the margay fight over kind of the same type of prey. And so that means that there is essentially a negative effect on other small cat species like the margay that live in proximity to ocelots. And it comes in the form of, okay, if there's a, uh, let's say a reserve, for example, that's perfect for ocelots and kind of these other small cats, it's of a specific size, right? But if the ocelot's there and the margay's there, the margay says, whoa, I don't want to step on this guy's turf. I don't want to get beat up. I want to get some food. The margay will then leave. And it, this this leaving of like not encroaching on the ocelot's territory because of, you know, prey or um, prey competition is actually known as the ocelot effect because the ocelot, it seems, is quite the bully in the terms of the small cat world. And, you know, it, it's not worth the margay's uh, best interest to stick around and fight for the same kind of food and things. And so I thought that was really ironic of people who refer to them as little ocelots, given that they don't get on well with the ocelots. They, they're not, uh, not friends. And so as you can imagine, this isn't a good thing in terms of especially if they're in a protected area. It's all good for the ocelot. But for margay and other small cat species, if they're forced out of these protected areas, they then go into unprotected areas, which, you know, often humans might interact with them, other habitat loss, it's not a pretty picture. And so it's definitely a conservation concern, to say the least, because how, how, how do you manage that? And uh, yeah, it's definitely something a bit tricky and worth thinking about, especially if you're a scientist. Um, in terms of some recent research, here's another cool picture of the margay doing what they do best in the trees. I mean, look at the strength of those ankles and going down head first because of their ankles being able to rotate 180 degrees. In 2018, researchers recorded the first instance of melanistic margays. Now, I know some of you guys watching are fans of Pokemon and how I often do those Pokemon animal comparison videos. Now, I'm because things are super busy for a couple of months, I'm going to put off this video. However, I do want to do a kind of shiny Pokemon biology in real life video. And melanism is actually one of the things I'm going to talk about. And so, um, you know, you have leopards and then there's black leopards, you know, that melanism. And so it was actually recorded for the first time back in 2018, melanistic margays. And they found one black individual in Colombia and another in Costa Rica of all places. And so it has been recorded. It does happen with margays. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I'd like to see a picture of it. I didn't find one, um, but it might be worth looking up because yeah, they're absolutely stunning. Ah, oh, you didn't know what little ocelot means, so I guess it was all true. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yes, indeed. No way Maui did that to me. Yes, he did. And he didn't even say he was sorry. Can you believe it? Like, he didn't even say excuse me. Like, come on. So for the final species, friends, that we are going to meet tonight. So we went over uh, to the beautiful part of Southern Asia to meet the fishing cat and get to learn a cat that actually enjoys water and is very good at swimming. We then made our way back over to uh, Central and South America to go into the jungles to meet a margay cat that loves life in the trees. And of course, for the final cat, we're heading, things are going to get hot here because we're going to the desert, to the sand areas. And can you still hear me? There we go, I'm back. Sorry, like I said in the beginning, apologies. It's very windy, very rainy out, and very stormy. And so alas, the internet can be a faff. But we are gonna hopefully think of uh, warm thoughts, thinking of uh, the beautiful sand cat. And this one in particular I had to share because my friend Alice 
with my little friends, Remy and Rory, the little face on this made me think of the two little fur nephew and nieces. So the sand hat is native to deserts in Africa and Asia. In particular, the Sahara Desert in Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and Central Asia. And of course, why is my PowerPoint not working? There we go. It's going to, at least we've made it to the final cat. Am I right? <laughs> so these sand cats have dense hair and pads on their feet that protect not only against the weather, but also help them move on the sand. They're very reliant on the sand. And so the name sand cat is most apt, most fitting. You know, sometimes animals get named the weirdest things and you're like, why did you name it that? But sand and this cat are truly, truly interconnected. Now, in terms of temperatures, I feel to put this in perspective for you guys, you know, I'm complaining about the weather now because I don't like the cold and the rain and the wind, but the sand cat lives in some pretty extreme temperatures. For example, the surface temperature where the sand cat lives can get up to 124 degrees Fahrenheit. For my Celsius friends, that's 51 degrees Celsius. Then, as if that wasn't hot enough, it can then drop down to 31 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative just under, just almost negative one degrees Celsius at night. That is an extreme amount of variation for this little cat to be able to live in. I mean, I don't know about you, but I couldn't bear, like 51, that's super hot. Like I can barely handle 40 degrees uh, Celsius and 31 Fahrenheit, meh. Meh, I'm okay now. But if I had to do that in my <laughs> on a regular basis, I don't know, guys. I don't think I would cope. But yet the sand cat copes. Now, here's another picture. Look at that face. Oh, so cute. Such a cute little cat. Um, and definitely, definitely characters, that is for sure. But I want to know, what do you guys think the sand cats do to help them survive in this weather. Now I forgot that I had this little video of them just sitting there looking cute, looking pretty as one does. But here's my slide so you can see the options. And of course, per the uh, you know mandatory cuteness overload, a picture of a baby sand cat. So what is one thing sand cats do to avoid the extreme weather? What do you guys think? Do you think they A, climb trees, B, find water, or C, burrow? What do you think? Ah, glad. I'm not the only one. Yeah, bring on the 40. Amen. Amen, Tiffany. Bring it on. I'm ready for it. I feel like I'm very much a uh, endotherm. No, an ectotherm. There we go. I know my difference. I am very much an endotherm, but I feel like I'm very reliant upon the sun to be active. I get very, very excited in the sun. Ah, so UK Amphibian says burrow, burrow, burrow. Very good, very good. I hope, yes, because we did discuss the margay and the fishing cat. And so it should come as no surprise that indeed you guys are correct. It is C, they burrow, which again is something I, you know, like how the margay climbs the trees and is very adept to being in the trees, whereas the fishing cat is very good at fishing and swimming and kind of hunts underwater. It's another thing to me, though, that really stands out about these cats is the fact that they burrow. <laughs> like, I don't associate cats with burrowing. And, you know, we've talked often about, you know, uh, other kind of animals that are really good at burrowing. You know, we know hares, like one of my favorite videos I did for one of my friends was like the magical side of hares. And they're very good at things like that. And yeah, I just can't imagine cats. And so with that, they will retreat to burrows when the temperatures are too extreme. And who can blame them? You know, 51 degrees Celsius. No, thank you. You know, or exceptionally when it's really cold as well. So they will burrow down to get out of the extreme heat or extreme cold. Now, digging this digging aspect isn't important just for escaping the weather conditions of either hot or cold. It's also an important part of their hunting strategy. So you notice with this adorable little kitten, uh, they have rather large ears. Now, 
Here's another picture. They too have some pre pretty impressive ears. And as we know from earlier on, they have 32 muscles in each ear. So very, very flexible in terms of being able to rotate. But in particular, the sand cat listens out for their prey. And you can see their legs, especially in this picture. They're a bit more stockier, not really long and lengthy. They're a bit shorter to the ground. And that comes in handy to be able to be closer to the ground to listen out for prey. And so they'll actually listen out for their prey that's underground. And if they hear the slightest little bit of prey being underground, they will rapidly dig to find and kill it. And it's just fascinating to be able to think, you know, because what dogs, you know, dogs dig and like bury their bones, right? But sand cats being able to dig so rapidly. And I guess that's part of the thing of why it's so important for them to be associated with sand because of not only their burrowing aspect, but also of how they hunt. And so you won't find them in places where like the soil is compact. It has to be sand for that burrowing adaptation, which as a biologist, you know, who focuses on zoos, if we have, you know, a sand cat in an enclosure, one of the best things and probably the most important is to be able to provide them opportunities to exhibit that natural digging behavior and burrowing behavior. And so it's so important for these guys. And they're really good at it too. I mean, uh, they got to do what they got to do. Now, speaking of burrowing, I want to know what you guys think. This is a pretty bizarre one. Uh, some cats, some sand cats may do this after killing their prey. Do you think they cover their meal and return to it later or leave it out to cook in the desert sun? What do you think? What do you think? Yes. Ah, is that you can't amphibians? Where's my mouse? Where is my mouse? Where is my mouse? I can't find my mouse. I'm trying. I want to show your comment. Yes. So crepuscular in nature. Exactly. So they are uh, time coming out and hunting based on the weather patterns, like you said. So early in the morning or kind of late at night, they are very, very, very well-timed with that regard. And anyways, who would want to be out at 51 degrees? Like, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Oh, you guys are saying A, although I kind of hoped it would be B, like leave it out to cook. <laughs> but yes, it is an Indeed, A, they cover their meal and return to it later, which made me think of dogs and how they bury their food and come back to it later. The sand cat has been known to do that with their food as well. Now, sand cats, oh no, I had an, oh, there we go. Uh, I had another few little bits about the sand cat in preparation for discussing in front of adorable picture of baby sand cats. Uh, I did want to mention that sand cats can actually share. So I don't know about you, but some of the cats that I've worked with uh, and have as pets, as my, you know, domesticated cats, they're not very good at sharing. But sand cats have been known to take turns sharing their shallow burrows, which is really nice. You know, if it's really hot outside, they'll be like, yeah, Sure, share the burrow. However, however, they will not share the same burrow at the same time. They'll be like, they'll kind of rotate amongst themselves and kind of still keeping each other distance. But yeah, sure, you can use that burrow. I thought that was quite nice. Um, but obviously they're like, no, no two, no two sand cats in the same burrow. So I guess the sharing and caring only goes so far. Now, ironically, I wanted to put this picture up to wrap up the evening of talking about some weird cats because, yes, I wanted to put this picture in because they are cute. However, I feel like I should mention that they are fearless snake hunters. So I talked about a lot about their uh, hunting adaptations, you know, the digging quickly in the sand, listening out for the prey. But in terms of what they eat, I wanted to save the best for last because these cute little kittens eat venomous vipers. That's right. They are fearless when it comes to hunting these snakes. They don't hold back. They go for it. But also, again, going to some of you know, the other cat species that are opportunistic or generalist, they, because of where they live, you can't be picky. You can't be a Maui or Kiana. Actually, I, I threw Maui under the bus by saying he was a picky eater. Kiana's the worst 
picky eater of them all. Like we try changing from Tesco's to Sainsbury's cat food and God help us. She was like, no, she like stormed out of the house, literally. Um, but the sand cats, they don't have that luxury because of where they live in the deserts of Africa and Asia. They'll eat not just kind of venomous vipers, but small rodents, they'll eat hares, they'll eat birds, which leads me to mention the, one of the coolest things about these sand cats is the fact that they can survive without drinking water for weeks at a time. Not that it's suggested that you do this, um, especially if you're a sand cat, but I think the thing to keep in mind is that they have made that adaptation where they don't need to drink water um, for a period of time. But rather than drinking water, they'll actually get their moisture from their prey that they eat. But it's still a fascinating adaptation for life in the desert. And I think tonight it was really fun to showcase with you guys three unique cats one from kind of the jungles, one from the water per se with the fishing cat, and then of course from the desert with the sand cat. These smaller cats not often get that much attention. And you know, earlier on this year, or I guess technically last year, I did a video about the um, palaces cat or Manul, as it's also known, AKA like the original grumpy cat. And it, it's these interesting cats that need to get some love and get some limelight because they truly are fascinating and have some incredible adaptations to survive in some pretty gnarly environments. I don't know about you, but you can't get much gnarlier than the world of the sand cat. And talk about kind of some animals that are like real life Pokemon. These adaptations are absolutely brilliant. Um, and I would like to know in the comments kind of which ones were your favorite? Was it the Manuel? I Was it the Manuel? I mean, it can be the Palaces cat. If you remember about the Palaces cat, uh, they're more of the snow type variety or maybe the fishing cat. Uh, I do actually, I almost forgot. I knew I was forgetting something. The recent study about the sand cat. Let's go back to the picture to look at the cute picture of the sand cats. While I talk about this study uh, that looked at habit habitat suitability in Iran. So this is a really cool paper. And again, I'll pop it down in the description down below if you want to check it out and read it later. It is free to read, which is exciting. Um, but in this particular region of Iran, they looked at various landscape metrics to see actually how suitable is this habitat for sand cats. And as we've noticed, and discuss, they're very dependent on sand, not compact soil. They need the sand for burrowing, for hunting, and whatnot. They also looked, uh, in terms of those metrics, two in particular kind of stood out. The scientists looked at the brightness index, as well as the salinity index. And using a couple different metrics like those index and whatnot, they found that about 75% of the total area was suitable for sand cats. Now you're thinking, okay, great. What does that mean? It's not really what it means in terms of that particular area is good for sand cats. It's more what they're gonna do with this information. The authors were very, very uh, clear about saying that this particular region has not had any kind of conservation planning and they wanted to use this study to draw and request more conservation attention and action. Because as we see, you know, with many species around the world, habitat destruction, encroachment from humans, it is happening and it is making a lot of incredible animals kind of lose their native range and decline in population numbers. And so what I really found fascinating about this paper was the fact they said, yeah, we found this, this is how we found it. But more importantly, come on, use this information to make active changes to protect this area before it becomes a problem, not after. They're very being proactive with this approach. And uh, yeah, props to you scientists uh, that worked on that project and that paper for not only raising awareness of the suitable habitat for sand cats, but you know, stepping out to say, yeah, we need to do, we need to put some action in place. And so sand cats, there's uh, a couple different incredible kind of conservation breeding programs in some zoological collections. Uh, there's what's called an SSP. And so that's kind of the American version of uh, kind of the matchmaker for animals within a, a collection of saying, okay, making recommendations on, I think Bob 
and Jill will make a great breeding pair because they're very kind of genetically different and their offspring, you know, will be of good genes and to keep the population genetically viable. And so, yeah, I follow the Sandcat SSP on Instagram and I encourage you to as well, if you like sand cats and seeing cute pictures of sand cats, but they often post not only pictures, but some cool information about the sand cat as well. So with that in mind, uh, yeah, just what is your guys's favorite animals? Let's see, let me go to the comments. Sand cats are cool. Yeah, sand cats are your favorites. We got, we got a lot. Palace's cat, nice. Tiff likes them all. Good, very diplomatic. Tiffany, very diplomatic. <laughs> But yeah, there's so much. And I will say, you know, luckily, you are all lucky that Maui wasn't in this room and didn't see that none of you said Maui, he would be very disappointed in you. And in fact, if you want to showcase your love for Maui, be sure to check out the Shelby on Safari squad shop for Peter merchandise and Maui merchandise and all that jazz. Uh, definitely get it. Get yourself a cool little mug, a little Maui mug. I need to get some promotional pictures of Maui drinking out of his mug as well. And yes, I will get one um, <laughs> for Tammy. Yes. And yes, I'll pop that. I'll do that before I run downstairs and make dinner, UK amphibians. I will uh, pop my links for more information about the sand cats and all the other animals, including that cool conservation study right after this, because I have them up on my screen. So I'll pop them in there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, guys. If you enjoyed this video, I encourage you to give it a thumbs up, whether you're watching live or on replay, maybe share it with a friend that needs to know more about sand cats, or more importantly, if you find something cool in the links, and you know, just raising awareness about these amazing animals, that's the best thing we can do in terms of conservation and raising awareness, especially with these lesser known species like the margay, the fishing cat, and seems like with overwhelming love, the sand cat. Woo -woo! Well, with that, have a great rest of your evening. Join me tomorrow on Instagram to follow along my adventure, which will be in a upcoming video. I'm not sure when I'll release it, but I will be going to be meeting one of Lucky LD's favorite animals. I uh, don't know how close I'll get, but I'm hoping I'll be able to at least see little Loki at London Zoo. Uh, <laughs> spoilers, Loki's a cute little tiger. I'm so excited. And obviously he's named after one of my favorite Marvel characters. So he's got to be perfect, right? Literally perfect. Ooh, see what I did there? Uh, but also in Friday's video, the safari continues. You'll actually be coming with me to Marwell to continue meeting some really cool animals that if you visit Marwell or any kind of collection, you need to see these animals. So often than not, giraffes, elephants, cheetahs get the limelight, but I'm gonna introduce you to a handful of animals that are at Marwell Park that you got to see that are really rare, really cool, and definitely worth your attention. So join me on Friday for that. But with that, it's time to go cook some dinner after I share the links in the description. <laughs> but yes, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you later, alligators. Bye, guys. <laughs>